Hi world, it's the 1st of April 2024, it's about 5pm UK time. Sun's in Aries, Moon's in Capricorn, Virgo's rising. I've been waiting for this month for a very long time. I first spotted this eclipse that's coming up about 8 or 9 years ago. And then I realised that the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction was going to be this month. And the closer we get, the more things have been revealing themselves, if you like. I've been getting clearer and clearer about A, what's going on, and B, what the potential ramifications of this month are. But those of you who have been listening to me for a long time will know that I've been talking about April 2024 as being a kind of nexus point as in some doors closing other doors opening for a very long time and at the start of this year I was very clear when I said that April 2024 is the month that changes everything and that by the time we're into May 2024 80% of the challenges of this year are going to be over but May 20, April 2024 is the time where everything changes and there's, there's a number of different reasons for this so let's look at the big picture first of all Pluto has moved into Aquarius. Neptune is approaching the very end of Pisces. Uranus is over two thirds of the way through Taurus, brewing up for the big lineups that are coming up in 25 and 26. But we can deal with that once this month is over. In this month, there is a total eclipse of the sun that starts over the Southern Pacific, makes its way over Northern Mexico, and then through the Central Southern States, the Southeastern States, up over the Mississippi and into the Northeastern States of the US of A, into the Far Eastern States of Canada, and then over the Atlantic Ocean, finally petering out north of the Azores, uh, with one or two little partial bits of an eclipse just touching the west coast of Ireland and the north of Scotland. It is a total eclipse of the sun, which means that the sun and the moon are in the same degree of not only that of not only the same degree of longitude, but also the same degree of latitude. And the fact that the moon is about 360 times smaller than the sun in terms of diameter and the fact that it is 360 times closer to the earth than the sun and if these figures weren't precise we wouldn't get total eclipses as we know it a bit of cosmic synchronicity there and a bit of sacred geometry in the heavens there's many more examples of this as the students on my course are finding out every week There was a partial eclipse of the full moon about 10 days ago, eight to nine days ago. Ah, seven or eight days ago, actually. And it was a penumbral eclipse, as in the moon's shadow was briefly occluded. There, there was, it, wasn't, it wasn't major at all, not in terms of astronomical accuracy, but a number of people reported uh, a lot of challenging times over this last week. And to, a, to an extent, these eclipses are harbingers of times to come. I've reformulated my thinking on eclipses in recent years. Obviously, if, you are, if your chart is being hammered by this eclipse, then obviously it's going to have an impact on you. It is a new moon. It's taking place at 18 degrees of Aries. So if you're born on the, 8th, 6th, on the 7th, 8th, 9th of April or October or... 8th, 9th, 10th of July, or 8th, 9th, 10th of January, then yes, this eclipse is directly impacting on you. But it is the bigger picture I'm concerned about. It is taking place over America and northern Mexico. And bearing in mind what else is going on in America with its Pluto return, the upcoming election, two old dinosaurs slugging it out, um, it suggests to me that the dichotomy that is tearing America apart between left and right 
isn't going to get better anymore. There's no central ground. There is so much anger, or almost hatred, for each side towards the other, that the idea of finding a consensus in America at the moment just seems impossible. But this is not just America, it is representative of what else is going on everywhere else in the world. And this eclipse in Aries, the sign that deals with personal growth, it, me, 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 I, what I want, what I get, it's not going to go a long way towards healing divides, let's put it that way. The eclipse itself is not aspecting any other planet significantly in the sky. And if it were just a normal partial eclipse, I wouldn't be too worried about it. But the fact that it's a total does give it some gravitas. And the fact that it's taking place at the time of other significant astrological things in the heavens is also very significant. Because shortly after this, the eclipse, I believe, is on the 8th. Shortly after this, around the 20th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st of April, we have the Jupiter conjunct Uranus in Taurus. In, mythology, in Greek mythology, where we get most of our astrological archetypes in Western society, Jupiter and Uranus are grandfather and grandson. They generally get on quite well. Both of them dislike Saturn. Saturn was Uranus's son and Jupiter's father. I'm not going to go into the gory details here, but there's, there's quite a convoluted history of them disemboweling each other and cutting each other up. So there's a, there's a lot of dislike here. But Jupiter and Uranus are fairly friendly with each other most of the time. I have found over my 45 years of study that the conjunction of Jupiter and Uranus is perhaps the single most common factor in forecasting major geophysical events, by which I mean earthquakes and volcanoes. Not so much weather patterns. So I do expect huge seismic activity, geothermal and geophysical developments in a number of places around the world over this coming month, over this next six weeks. By the time we are into the middle of May, this conjunction will be fading. But this is not only to do with the geophysical. Anyone who's being affected by this conjunction is going to go through massive shake-ups in their life. And this is predominantly affecting people, it's affecting people born around the... 10th to the 14th of May and November, the 11th to the 15th of August, and the 8th to the 13th of February. People born around three weeks into Aquarius, Leo, Taurus and Scorpio. And if you're one of these, then this last year or two has been full of unexpected changes. And change can be disruptive and chaotic and dramatic and sudden and unpredictable. And it can pull the rug from underneath your feet and send everything spinning and bring chaos and disorder. But it can also bring stimulus and novelty and originality and excitement and adventure with words like independence, freedom and liberty. This is what Uranus does. It brings change in quite a sudden and dramatic way. And now Jupiter's going to be on top of Uranus. Jupiter amplifies everything it touches. And it can amplify things in changing things from what is merely a drama into a full-blown crisis. It can make things seem much larger than life and over the top, and mountains made out of molehills. And it can really exaggerate things to the point where it's just, well, in England we call it a storm in a teacup. But it can also amplify things in terms of bringing joy, hope, optimism, humour, faith. And the combination of Jupiter and Uranus, when you take the crises and the drama out of it, it's actually quite a positive thing because it breeds the potential for positive revolution or re-evolution at a social level. It opens up to new technological ideas, new ways of seeing the world. 
That this is happening in the sign of Taurus, the sign that's most commonly associated with materials, values, possessions, assets, money, food, suggests that we're going to be revolutioning our ideas of farming, of uh, the way we grow food, the way we genetically modify food, and also the way we've managed money. When Uranus moved into Taurus six years, five, six years ago, I said, well, this is the end of the old banking systems as we know it. Crypto is going to become a much more valid thing. And that hasn't quite worked out the way I expected. But certainly new methods of money, new ways of working with money have become the norm these days. And this is only going to escalate. So I wouldn't be surprised to see quite a bit of financial wobble for a period of two or three weeks in the second half of April, first week of May. But if this were to happen, it's not going to be on the scale of 2008 or 2012. It is going to be, again, a storm in a teacup. The Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is more likely to affect certain powerful individuals. It falls exactly on the sun sign position of Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister. It falls, it's pretty much opposite the dis disgraced, the discredited uh, ex-Home Secretary of Britain, Suella Braverman. It falls exactly square to the Pluto on the midheaven of Vladimir Putin. I expect big changes over the coming two or three weeks in the roles and the lives of a number of of very prominent political figures in the world, and we are heading into a period of short-term volatility and instability at the global political level. I do not think this is going to end up in any more larger warfare situations than the world is already going through, but April is the most unstable and unsteady time of this year. And it's not enough that we have a total eclipse and a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. We get a total eclipse of the Sun on average about once every two and a half to three years. We get a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction about every 14 years. So to have two of them within a couple of weeks of each other, well, multiply three by 14 and then by two. So it's about um, once every 80, 85 years, we get a combination this strong. But there are other factors as well. And this is where it gets a bit sticky. Mars is now in early Pisces and Mars is now moving on into conjunction with Saturn over the coming week, week and a half. And on the, I think it's the 10th of April, Mars will conjunct Saturn exactly at 14 degrees of Pisces. A Mars conjunct Saturn is not an easy aspect. It brings a lot of issues up around anger management, anger suppression. It brings up a lot of anger issues around the way that authority is used and wielded. It can see a lot of um, anger towards suppression, repression of anger or overly structured, overly disciplined forms of control. It's anyone born with a Mars Saturn conjunction in their chart has to deal with a lot of issues around anger management and they can become quite on a negative side, angry towards male role model imagery, out of control of themselves physically, and a bit resentful about the way the world works. Alternatively, people born with a Mars Saturn conjunction, if they use the energy instead of letting it use them. They become black belts at martial arts. They become excellent archers. They become sharp, focused, great stamina, great self-discipline. But it has to be a conscious use of the energy. Otherwise, it will use you, and then you get bumps, bangs, burns, bruises, broken bones. So for anyone being affected by the Mars-Saturn conjunction, which is those people born right in the middle of Pisces, Virgo, Gemini, Sagittarius then the period around the 8th to the 12th of um, April is a time to count to 10 and deliberately choose not to let your buttons get pushed. And then at the end of the month, around the 28th, 29th of April, Mars will be at the very end of Pisces conjunct Neptune. 
Mars conjunct Neptune is a strange energy. It's common in the charts of alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, people who avoid and escape the world, whether it's through chocolate or uh, fantasy or video games. But it's also common in the charts with some of the greatest artists, sculptors, filmmakers, um, anyone who can bring a form of physical, dancers particularly, because Mars Neptune is about the blend of the physical with the spiritual. So there's a lot of direct energy and it's all very dynamic. Jupiter Uranus is dynamic. The eclipse is happening in Aries ruled by Mars. Mars is conjuncting Saturn and Neptune. There's lots of a, and and starting today, starting tonight, UK time, about 10 p.m. UK time, we enter into a long Mercury retrograde. Just when you think it can't get any worse, we're heading into a Mercury retrograde. The Mercury retrograde will end on the 25th of April. But the effects of it aren't, are going to continue through until perhaps second week of May. So for many people, I'm saying, well, look, no matter what the world throws at you over the coming four weeks, don't make major changes, of course, now, because if you do, it won't work out the way you expect. It's probably going to get worse. It might get better, but it's, you can't predict it. We're heading into the most unpredictable time of 2024. Now, those of you that know me, I've got this exterior of being a bit gruff uh, and, and someone christened me Mr. Grumpy, which I thought was hilarious. I love it. Underneath it all, those of you who know me well, now I've got a great sense of humour, a bit cynical, but now I'm getting old. And I choose to look at the positive side of all this. Firstly, the big eclipse, it's not hitting any other planets, so it's a standalone thing. The Jupiter-Uranus thing, it's not really hitting any other planets, but it's enough on its own. And yes, there will be some geophysical things that are going to cause us to stop and take stock, both of the role of political leaders in our lives, and there's a number of them coming up for interesting developments, and not just the ones I've mentioned, but also potential, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Jupiter-Uranus is opposite the son of Joe Biden and Prince Charles. Um, I believe it's also affecting the chart of Netanyahu. I haven't checked that recently, so I can't be sure on that. A lot of big changes are coming up. But then, without change, you get entropy, which leads to decay. Change is necessary for evolution. So I see it as a positive thing, particularly in terms of waking us up to the accelerated degradation of a planet we live on and if there are more volcanoes or earthquakes coming this is going to make us have a really cold detached look at the way we treat our planet and with the mars saturn and the mars neptune this is a message at an individual as much as as a collective level it's saying how do you use your energy or do you let your energy use you do you seek to find blame do you seek to find reasons and excuses why your life is so difficult, why things happen to you, why things are so tough? Is it always someone else's fault and it's never you? Or do you choose to use the energy that's being presented to you and become more disciplined, focused with a sharper attention and concentration and do your best to become a better human being by taking total responsibility for your thoughts, your actions, your emotions... We've been brought up to, to make blame, to find reasons why we can't do things. This has caused uh, a development of things such as greed, disempowerment, and constantly finding blame with someone else. It's always someone else's fault. Let's start taking responsibility for ourselves. And the more we take responsibility for ourselves, the more we take responsibility for the fate of the planet that we live on. We don't, the planet doesn't need us. We need this planet. So this is a call not to action. I'm not advocating rebellion or revolution. I'm advocating greater self-responsibility for everything you do. Everything. Your actions, your thoughts, your feelings, your words. Time to get out of the blame game that's been imposed on us by 2,000 years of dominator culture. 
Time to take responsibility for ourselves because the more you change your world, the more the world becomes a better place. I'm going to end this by... I didn't mean to do this, but I'm going to end this by saying what I've always said. Those of you who have ever had an email from me will know that over the last 25 years, my tag has always been, negativity can't exist where there's humour. So find the humour, even through the tears. Let's get through this most difficult month of 2024. And like I say, from May onwards, it gets, starts getting a lot, I'm not going to say easier, clearer. And we can start to find joy again. Let's get there. Catch you later. Bye.